the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges that we are on the unceded territory of the Lenni Lenape, Canarsie, Shinecock, and Muncie peoples. We acknowledge the many indigenous nations with ties to this land, and we recognize that the Lenape still call Manhattan home. The Brooklyn Rail stands in solidarity with the uprisings unfolding across the country following the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDiet, Nina Pop, David McCatty, James Skurlock, Jamel Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Richard Brooks, Rhea Milton, Dominique Remy Fells, Torian Solo, among countless others, and in response to generations of structural violence against Black communities. Black Lives Matter, and we will continue to support ongoing action in the struggle for racial justice. Before I introduce our host, we'd like to begin with a brief moment of silence. Thank you. And now to introduce today's hosts, we have Lewis Block, who is a painter based in Brooklyn. His writing has appeared in the Brooklyn Rail, Hyperallergic, and Full Bleed Journal. And his work has been shown in Baltimore, Philadelphia, New Jersey, and Venice. We also have Joan Waltima, who grew up on the Great Plains and now lives and works in New York City, shown in New York, Chicago, Portland, Baltimore, London, Basel and Cologne. Her work is in the collections of the Museum of Modern Art, the National Gallery, the Hammer Museum, and the Harvard University Art Museum, among others. She has written extensively on art and served as editor at large of the Brooklyn Rail since 2001. Um, she is currently the director of Micah's Leroy E. Hofberger School of Painting. And without further ado, over to Lewis. Thanks so much, Sophia. And thank you, Susan, for being here with us today. Um, I'm looking forward to our conversation. I'll begin with a, a brief bio for Susan, and then we can get into the questions. Susan Fracon was born in 1941 in Mexico, Pennsylvania. Following her degree in fine arts from the Pennsylvania State University, she spent three years at the École Nationale Supérieure des Beaux-Arts in Paris and studied paintings in museums throughout Europe. Fracon has exhibited widely in the US and internationally. In 2008, her work was the subject of a major solo exhibition titled Form, Color, Illumination, Susan Fracon Painting at the Menil Collection in Houston, which traveled to the Kunstmuseum Bern in Switzerland. She has participated in a number of group exhibitions such as the 2000 and 2010 Whitney Biennials. And in 2016, Fracon received the Artist Award from the Artist Legacy Foundation in Oakland. Her work is held in the collections of the Museum of Modern Art, the National Gallery, the Whitney, and many other institutions. Her most recent show at David Werner Gallery is up now through October 17th. This is her seventh solo show with the gallery, which has represented her since 2008. And I will pull up uh, an image of the show and then we'll turn it to Joan for the first question. Well, before Susan disappears, let me say, Susan, it's so great to see you and to see your show. And I want to say hello to everyone who's out there listening to us today. And thank you for joining. Um, you want to take the first, you want to put up the first image? Um, it's, I think it's wonderful to look at your work while we talk. I was just remembering when I started to prepare to the questions to talk to you today that, gosh, it was a while ago when we, we met up in Mexico and you were going to join a bird watching group and we traveled around a little bit and went to the Monte Alban, which was incredible to see with you. Um, and I noticed after you went on your bird watching uh, trip and I went, I went on that I was looking at birds and hearing birds and seeing birds in the, in the environment in a way that I, I never had before. And I was so grateful to do that. So the first thing I wanted to ask you is, um, are you still pursuing your love of bird watching in different parts of the world? Yes, I, I, uh, Beautiful. I just think uh, that there's, as you know, there's so many tragedies happening right now and, and the birds are so tiny, the ones that migrate. And so uh, up here in 
Germantown. I have three acres, so I, I've worked hard to make it very bird friendly by having lots of pollinators and planting trees and so on and so forth. And, and that's, that was about four years ago. And I, the birds really do come here. I see a lot of them now, so I can bird looking out my window or sitting on my front porch, but I definitely walk a, a lot looking for birds, but I'm not so successful in spotting them. Joan, you were terrific at spotting them. I remember how you showed me these beautiful birds that flew up while we were on the terrace of that restaurant eating. You spotted all these fabulous warblers. Oh yeah, I remember that. Well, I was trained from a young age to look at look for birds. Oh, good. Good. Um, just to move over to your paintings now. Um, oh my God, it was so fantastic to to be in those rooms and and see your show. And I, the first thing I really became aware of when I was looking at your work was how different paintings. Um, sort of uh, bring you as a viewer to assume a certain position in relation to the work. Like sometimes it's a bird's eye view or a plan view, like in architecture. And sometimes you're like looking, looking straight at something and sometimes that point of view disappears. So um, I wanted to ask you if you think about how your forms and compositions imply a point of view when you're working or if that's a result of searching for something else that just happens at the end or when the painting's finished okay um when you uh when you mentioned seeing the show firsthand i i i know that that's the best way to experience the artwork and these pictures these installation shots are great but they they can't replace the actual experience um, of the light the changes in the light and um walking through and just walking around the paintings so as for this um so uh, the paintings speak for themselves I always say that, and then I speak about them. <laughs> art, say, art says thing, I'm using a quote, art says things that only art can say. I don't know who said that, but I, I, it, it is exactly what I feel. Um, so I'll answer your question that I, I guess there's no intentional pictorial perspective in my paintings except for the values um, of the colors. Like in the, in the cathedral, the stone cathedral, some of the colors, um, they, they go back and forth and some become foreground and some become background. And, it shifts and, and I do that with, with the sheens on the paint too. And then the light sets up other relationships that turn some of the shiny surfaces into positive and negative colors. So to me that all activates the painting and, and makes it come alive and come off the walls and be with the viewer. and. You can see I hang them low uh, so that the viewer can physically enter them, you know. So um, what I love about the that shifting perspective that you achieve is like in that stone cathedral painting, the, the top panel of the painting, you're looking at it straight on. And the bottom panel seems like you're looking at it from above. So when I'm standing there, I feel like that gets me like both in my body and out of my body. It makes me really aware of my own physical relationship to the painting. And I feel like that 
in itself kind of clues you in to look at the density and you know when you look at these images of the paintings you get about 10 percent of the information that the paintings hold but you don't realize that you're not getting the whole information because there it is and you know it's a photograph of it it's indexical so um, that's always deceptive well i i have to thank david swerner and annabelle seldorf and as along with Bellatrix Huber for this beautiful space for inviting me to show my paintings in the most beautiful space I've ever shown in. And, and the light is magnificent. You can see the floor interacts with the paintings in a, in a very beautiful cooperation with them. So, um, some, to get back to your questions, sometimes I'm inspired by colors and forms I see around me in real life, in painting, other paintings, travel, and books when I can't travel. And they all contain sources of knowledge for the development of all the elements in my work. Um, but most powerful is what uh, what the, the resonance in my mind's eye of what I see, and that generates and contributes to building the actual paintings. So I make many small sketches to format, to format my ideas and visual images. And then I uh, go forward with plans to see if they work. But all my, all my decisions are visual. If I use, um, all the helpers, like the proportions, the materials, it, it all has to be, it has to please me first visually, and then hopefully it will, it will relate to the viewer and provide you the same experience to the viewer. So I'm sort of the first person to see them, and then I like to have other people be guinea pigs and come in and see them and, and, and react to them. But, you know, um, I, I wanted to say um, the outside form of the one panel generates all of the composition, these two measurements, but we'll go into that more later. But back to, back to your question, I, I went to Crete in 1990, and it was a lifelong dream to go to Crete. I, I always wanted to go there, and and I used to stand in front of the ruins, at the, the various ruins, and I I was so fascinated with the labyrinths there. So I would try to imagine walking into those complex labyrinths. So at that time, I, I began to do watercolors and paintings that came from my imaginary walks inside the labyrinths with, with the actual ruins of the ground footprints of them in front of me. And um, this all changed and dissolved over the years. I, I, but I wanted to get that into your question. It makes, it, it makes me think of another question. I really want to ask you about how you feel like time operates in your work, because when you're talking about as Minoan uh, ruins in the, in being in Crete, it's like, that's, it's so long ago, but when you're there and you have the kind of experiences that you're describing, it's like it's very present, you know, and then when you bring it to your work, it also becomes very present, so. Oh, yes. When, when I stood there, I'm so glad you said that because I had never seen Minoan artwork before, and it was 4,000 years old, and, and it was so alive when I would look at the art in the museum. It just was the present, it came to the present, it, it, and that's the way art is. It, it's constant in that it, it lives when you experience it. And, um, you know, some things 
fall apart and even with just the ruins they were so powerful for me to see them to see these 4000 year old ruins and and the culture just incidentally it was a a matriarchal society so they didn't have any wars so that helped their artwork live on too it wasn't destroyed by wars <laughs> Hopefully we're moving back into one of those periods now. <laughs> oh, I wish. I'm not Susan, knowing I wanted anybody. There are gentle men too. I know that for a fact. Yeah. Susan, I wanted to ask while we're looking at these installation views, especially this one, um, about the strategy for installing the works. And obviously the light is so important in these, um, these sunlights here, but especially in the last room, there's a sense of movement between the canvases. Um, do you want to talk about how you, you place the works in the rooms yeah, themselves? I'd love to talk about that. Uh, first of all, I took this shot myself because I wanted to show the light and, and the variations. I love the shadows and, the, and how that plays with the paintings. So I was trying to show that um, so I, I, months before the exhibition, I actually finished the paintings quite a long time before the exhibition date. And it usually takes me a long time to, so I wanted to give myself ample time so that I wasn't hurrying to paint because time stops when I'm painting, I insist on that. I don't want to hurry to paint or I really run into trouble. So, so I had all the paintings finished and they hadn't moved to the gallery yet. And they gave me, Bella gave me a beautiful uh, little plan of the floor plan. And I thought it was going to be open space. So I, I arranged all the paintings in a sequence and I could do that I could see one next to the other. I have two studios, one in New York and one in uh, up here. And up here is where I can do my major work. But New York, I, I did half the work there too. But I was able to plan out what colors, you know, the sequence of walking through and how the colors and the paintings and the forms played off of each other because I didn't want to have all the... Um, lunette type paintings in one room. And so, you know, I gave that a lot of thought. And, and then when we came to install the show months later, I, we started with the original sequence that I had planned out and it worked. And, and since then I had to have walls, which I didn't want at first. I wanted it to be open space but I had to keep the walls because of the COVID and I won't explain the, the whole story about that, but I had to have four rooms instead of, instead of two big rooms, I had to have four rooms and they were very big rooms and they were very adequate. In fact, they were perfect for the paintings. And so each room had two walls and the last room had three walls. And so it just worked out perfectly that the last room, I put three paintings and then you went around, as you said, Lewis, you went around and went back through the show backwards because there was no exit in the last room. So it just fell into place and it didn't take us long at all to install. The that color sequencing is so clear, especially in this last room here that we're showing. Uh, they just drive you from one to the next in a circle, and it's wonderful. Well, we were happy with it, and I, I feel it's uh, certainly the best exhibition and, that I've had. And um, also, it's the first time, I think, that I've shown so many paintings in one exhibition. I usually only have six big paintings or seven but I had nine that worked all together. So 
it's it's up. I wish it could stay up forever. <laughs> I told David Swerner, I think this should stay up forever. <laughs> he didn't. <laughs> okay, I'll stop now. <laughs> Joan, did you want to talk uh, more specifically about the surfaces um, of these paintings? Well, now we're looking at that bluebird painting, so I feel like, um, you know, in the installation, when I came into that last room and I saw that uh, painting, the bluebird illumination, I didn't read the title. I just walked in and saw those colors and it was just like so shocking. And like, I felt like it had something that embodied this kind of intensity of a scream or like, but then it was at the same time so purely joyful. And I was really, mystified by that and it, it seemed so amazing um so i was just so i asked you about it like what were you what was going on with you and you told you started to tell me something so i i would like you to share that um well i love your reaction i love your emotional reaction to the colors because uh, that's the content um and and i I um, I have used those colors before. Maybe maybe you haven't seen work, but I did a lot of studies on paper with those colors, and then I did um, some paintings using those colors. And I just um, I wanted to revisit using a screaming blue and a screaming the screaming cadmium marja. I never used the bright blue in a big painting with a with a high pitched orange, and it's, it's so orange great. straight uh, cadmium shiny surface, and the blue is a mixture of ultramarine and um, turquoise green old Holland, and I was trying I was actually trying to get I watched the bluebirds fly through my yard, which is so thrilling. And I was trying uh, in my failed way to capture that blue in paint. And so um, I titled it Orange and Bluebird Blue Illumination. And that's my titles are just designations there in lowercase because they don't, they aren't illustrative of, of what I'm, what the painting is. So uh, when I heard you talk about it, I was thinking about the birds again and like how w sometimes you describe like when you see a bluebird in a flash, there's this sort of exhilaration of that intense blue that's, that's, you know, wow, you see that. But then the way it also has that scream, it's almost like the fright or the flight of the bird from a subjective point of view of the bird is also captured in there. You feel like the birds, uh, you know, escaping or, you know, something disturbed it and it flies off. You know, well, there's also well, that I love, there. I love the freedom of the bird when I see it because the bird is yeah. free. It's flying by and it doesn't care about you and it doesn't know how beautiful it is that you find it. <laughs> and, and, um, there's a little picture in my book that Eleanor Ray took of, of a bluebird. I went birding with her and, and she, she's very good at photographing birds. <laughs> and, wow. and she got, she kind of captured, and there's also an artist who captures that little blue that's, that's created by the sun. The feathers are not blue. The feathers are, the color is created by the light flashing on it as it flies by or as it sits and it's it's almost miraculous so it's like art it's it's ungraspable you can't really nail that color in a paint <laughs> it it can only be seen and you can't pin it down and you also get the flashes of the complementary colors once you've been looking at the painting for a while and you turn away back to the white wall you can see those imprints flashing on the wall, especially with this painting, because it's so vibrant. 
Oh, that's really a nice observation. I, I haven't thought about that before. I, I was thinking mainly about how the three paintings played off of each other. And then, then in the next room, you went into silence with the vernal breath of spring. It's a very silent kind of painting. Let so me pull that one up. I, I like... Before we go, I, I want to say, I think this, I love this shot because you can see when you're on the side angle, how the reflectivity and the density of the, um, of your materials are starting to work. And um, I was wondering if, um, like when I look at it and being a painter myself, you know, I know the complexity of trying to achieve um, a control over your materials. So of course I want to ask you, um, do you have secret uh, recipes? Do you um, make your own paint? Um, do you, or is this something that's relatively easy and straightforward for you at this point? Well, to well basically it's more paint and less paint. And I use it, it, it stemmed from seeing the, when I, when I would look at a, I think it crystallized when I was standing in front of a Chimabue in the Louvre years ago and I, I was searching for the negative and the positive effect of burnished gold and it happened in, in the Louvre and I finally, I decided I was going to go forward with, with uh, exploring, trying to get that into my paintings, uh, the negative and the positive because that, that gives a whole other level to the dimensions of the painting when they shift to from a dark in the composition to a light in the composition. And they also reflect you and it, they reflect the surroundings when you're looking at it. But they're not like mirrors. They're, they're just uh, surfaces that play with the light. But that comes from me, the medieval burnished gold paintings. And, and they're, and they're, and they're the whole process of gold leafing and and how it um, reflected the soul of the artist and the flaws were part of the soul of the artist and um, and it's when it was used in medieval times it had a red underground that set off the gold too so when it wore away you'd see the little bits of red reflected and I was doing that for a while but it took me much too long to, uh, I'm sorry, my phone is talking to me. It took me much too long to work on gold leafing. So I, I'm trying to uh, use the paint, the colors. I wanted to work with the colors. I'm, when I was doing gold leafing, I wanted to get back to the colors and not spend all my time on gold leafing because Color is so important, but when we go into my studio, I'll show you um, the I some of the notes I make. I make very precise notes of each step, each uh, application of paint, and and um, I can refer back to it then if I want to reuse. If I want to try to use that mixture again, I can refer back to it. One of the things I find I really, really interesting, well, I just suddenly got an echo. I find really interesting is that, like how you were describing the relationship of your audience, the, the viewer's body in relationship to the colors and the reflectivity is very similar to the kind of thing that happens with a what I what my first question was was the perspectival views how it's shifting you in and out of a certain awareness of where you are yourself in relationship to the painting and so I think that consistency creates like this whole experience as uh, when you when you apprehend the painting as when you're standing in front of it because there's these all these ways in which it speaks to your body and like pushes you subtly this way or that way to a, to a different kind of awareness of yourself looking at the painting or being in the present moment. Thank you for saying that because um, 
that's very um, moving to me that that you can explain what's happening to you in that way. When you see my paintings, I can only hope that that happens. But um, thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. I think Lewis was going to move now to another image. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I was muted. I know we wanted to talk about uh, Vernal Breath of Plum. Um, and in a way, it's such a different color relationship than the, the bluebird illumination that we were looking at. Um, can you talk about how those colors developed? I know Joan wanted to ask about this one as well. I just sort of had in my mind's eye this, this shape. Uh, you know, I, I, it took me a lot of thinking to, to decide what colors, and it was, it was um, connected in some way to the spring and, and my love of Japanese culture and art and plum blossoms and the smell of the blossoms, which is, is so elusive and ungraspable. And so I, I pictured kind of in my mind a purple color and the color is purple ochre. And I, I like that color because it's not, um, it's, it's kind of a subtle, low-key color. And then the surround is, again, the French Royal Sienna that I, I've been using a lot um, in a reflective way. And so it took me a long time to find the title. And I, it was very pictorial, so I didn't, I didn't want it to be pictorial as usual. Um, so I think it relates a little bit to the smell of plums, blossoms, to the blossoms. It's certainly not about plums or plum trees or that, but um, it's just the elusive smell if you've ever smelled plum blossoms. And I'm growing, plum, I'm growing plum trees up here, so I have the first-hand experience. <laughs> I, I actually, when I was looking for my title, I kept looking for a Japanese poem where I could borrow a title, but I, could, I just couldn't because so many Japanese poets write, tried to write about the experience and the power, powerful experience of the plum blossom. It's the first thing in spring. It's one of the first blossoms that blooms. I, just for our, our audience who's looking at this work for the first time through the Zoom screen, the thing that's really elusive in this painting that you, I feel like appeared, it appeared for me as I was looking at it is the value contrast between the plum and the green and the background, the green is so slight that as you look at it, your eye kind of adjusts to the subtlety of that value. And then after a moment, you feel like, oh, there's this light coming from behind that plum shape. But that light is so elusive because you can't imagine where it's coming from. It's coming out of the colors. And I find that when I, I sat there for a long time and looked at that painting and was watching how the light was falling on the surface and it's beautiful if like there's also clouds going by and then you see that they change your perception of that light as you're looking at it, it really becomes alive. I, I <laughs> thank you again. <laughs> um, so I, I was trying to, to write a little phrase it, that came from your question number six, where you said there's a particular density and reflectivity to your surfaces that appears to be tied to your use of materials. And so I, I, I um, bring back this, this was in my press release, I think, and it says, the, the colors and surfaces vary in terms of density and reflectivity and areas in the compositions frequently shift between dark and light. Figure can become ground and ground 
it can become figure. And I prefer to define it as full and empty space. And I, I think that this happens in these two close colors that figure can become ground and ground can become figure or full space and empty space. They can be interchangeable. Whereas in the other painting here, Mars Stealing the Night, um, the colors are, the, the indigo can become void or figure and the orange can become ground or, yeah, or surround. So I like to play with that. And, and the indigo, if you go up close to the indigo, which I'll do when we go in my studio, if I have enough light, you can see the light coming from behind the indigo. It, it, it goes on it and it, it becomes an eggplant color and it comes behind it because the ground is white. So it, it's kind of um, light coming from inside and outside. And I, I think indigo is a very interesting color and I use it a lot. I love that color and it's more a dye than a color. It doesn't have uh, physical substance the way the earth reds have, but it just uh, has so many dimensions to the colors. It can, it can have reflections of blue and green and, and purple and light blue so it gives you it gives the viewer a lot it's all about what you're giving to the viewer or Lewis, what to, you have do you have a photograph of that painting from the side because i think if we looked at it from the side we could really see what susan's yeah you can get more what you're talking about when you see it like it really becomes a void here This one in particular, I found myself walking back and forth from one edge to, to the other just to observe those shifts. And you can't see it so much in the picture, but there is that modeled texture in the, the purple or indigo central form um, from the layering of the brush strokes and the ground showing through. I, you know, Louis, you asked me a question too about um, the division line. Yeah, I did want to ask about that's, that. That's a long topic. So do you want me to get into it here? Or do you want to wait? Um, sure, let's let's talk about it now. Let me uh, you know, go back to the frontal view. Before um, the, I, in yeah. your former paintings, the the line between the panels where they, the diptych comes together um, was an element that kept the forms within individual panels. And now they are bridging that gap and going across the dividing line. Um, and I just wanted to ask about the prog progression of that uh, decision and when it started. And you, I think you mean the stacked paintings, the vertical two, two panels, one on top yes, like, of the Yes, like in the cathedral yeah. series. Yeah, so the division line, that kind of, um, you know, I was researching to go back to the cathedral, um, I was researching Chart Cathedral. Yeah, that's good. Okay, these are older variations on, on this bedrock composition, which I can play with um, a, a lot of colors on it. These are three shiny blues and, and these are you know, multiple colors. But the dividing line is right between the equality of two, two equal panels. Um, and that sort of came from, I was trying to figure out the secrets of Chart Cathedral because I, I adore, I, I adore that, that magnificent building. It's just, uh, a forever kind of building that you can keep looking at. And I wanted to know the secrets and I couldn't find them. I, I looked in books and I spent years looking, but, but the, ha you know, the one to two proportion 
is there and the golden proportion is there. So, so I had both of these uh, weights and balances to play with in my composition. So I just let it, you know, I use the dividing line in a different way. So then when you get back to a painting like Mars Stealing the Night, I uh, later, later I, I decided I needed to, to explore some changes in my stacked paintings. And so I just turned them to the side. I, I put them side by side instead of one on top of the other. And then I had a very visible dividing line. So I played, my composition comes from, it's generated by that dividing line and the, the vertical horizontal proportion of each of the two panels. And, but I didn't want it to be symmetrical. So I put my point here to make, to make the uh, curve. I didn't want this side to be equal to this side. I wanted it to be set up an imbalance that I would try to throw back into a balance. And, and so I decided to make, to follow through as before and make this area equal in area to this area. So I, in order to do that while still using this compass line, I had to bring, foreshorten this side. So that gave me uh, what, it, what you're seeing as my bedrock are, composition. Are you talking about the areas of, um, for example, this shape yeah. with this shape being equal? That's yeah. what you're referring to? Okay. When you're yeah. when you're mapping out the structure like you just described, Susan, do you already see the colors that are going to go in it? Yes and no. I I don't have a hard and fast rule. Some sometimes I I you know change colors and with this composition, I've. I've done many variations of different colors. Like in one, I put the indigo here and I have another color here and the shiny and the matte goes back and forth. And in my studio, I have, um, I have one large one with a bright lemon yellow here. So we'll see that. <coughs> So this color, this color combination, I did decide in advance, but it's not always the case. You know, I, I work over long periods of time, so it takes me a long time. Everything is a visual decision and I go back and forth and then I try it out and most often it works, but sometimes it doesn't work and then I have to go back and also the material of the, of the paint, the, of the pigment figures into it because some of the pigments just don't like being mixed with oil. They, they <laughs> don't work as well. And, and so I have to uh, be subordinate to, to the properties of the pigments. I, I mean, have to indigo, work with them. indigo doesn't, is more of a dye. It doesn't really grind. I don't, yeah, I don't grind indigo. I buy it. The indigo I use is blocks indigo because it throws back the purple light. I've tried different brands, but I want that extra hit of purple coming back at you with the blocks indigo. So I, I will keep using it and I could use it all the time, but I have to restrain myself because I don't want every painting I do to have indigo. <laughs> and I also love, I love every color. I love the red earths um, that I previously had used so much. Uh, and I love the blues. I love lapis. I've been using lapis a lot, but it, it takes big quantities of lapis to do my lapis areas on the big paintings. <laughs> I can. Do you have other colors that you have like these 
like complex relationships too. It's almost like you're having a dialogue with color in a certain way. Yeah, I am. The hematites, I've been, they're so challenging. Have you ever used hematite? Yeah, those big paint, that big painting I had at the Academy, that whole, all the browns in there are hematite. And I have like five different kinds of hematite I'm using. Well, the hematite, I, I discovered that it could become silvery. I was trying to build it up on a painting a few years ago and make the red denser. And it, start get, it started getting shinier and, and throwing back reflecting light. And I realized that hematite can turn silver. It was turning silvery. So it's, it's always teaching me something. And these hem this, this hematite has a stain. It has an orange stain. And I, I, was, um, I was very, uh, very impressed with Japanese brushwood fences. And um, let's, yeah. So let's go to another image of this um, that's very oblique, this one. Let's go to that one. And you can see it almost becomes three-dimensional. And I, I didn't put much oil with this hematite. It's very grainy and it's thinly painted and it's brushy. And then this, this one is a different hematite that's more rose and it um, has more oil in it. It has more cold pressed oil in it. So that throws off the light and this absorbs the light. But this has the multi-dimension of having an orange stain on the ground. It puts an orange stain with one, one passage of color. And I redid this, this uh, four quadrant shape. I redid it five times. I took it off and put it back on again. And finally, the, the canvas wouldn't take any more paint removal. It was starting to get down to the nub of the fabric. So I, so the fifth time I thought, I have to do this right this time or I, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna waste this whole linen expensive <laughs> thing. So no, I sure. put all my focus into it and then I was satisfied with it. <laughs> well, it's beautiful. It's really, uh, when I saw that painting, I felt like the whole shift um, to the those round forms had yielded you something that like kind of catapulted you into a new area when I was looking at it and we were talking about the Minoan um, ruins and we had that shot where we see through those two rooms it felt like it was that far away from us you know and that close at the same time oh wonderful <laughs> you. Susan I wanted to ask about um, the way that the the shapes are drawn on the canvas because you had mentioned using implements like a, a compass to create curves but um, in the actual work of drawing them with with the brush can you just talk about that process so you you prefer uh, you don't want to know how i make them with a pin and a piece of well, string well both how how does it okay. develop <laughs> I have points where, you know, I, I do the plan to scale and it's one foot, it's 12 inches, the plan. Um, and then I blow it up um, mathematically to fit this structure, to fit this uh, 54 inch by 87 and 3 eighth inch panel. So uh, I put a point, it's, and then I have a long piece of string that I walk around and pull it taunt to get my curve. And the curve has to be just free. It can be, you know, sometimes I mess up the curve. I don't get it right. Uh, but it has to be a visual, visually pleasing and work within this area, this has to work with this and this with all of this. 
and it's actually four quadrants of unequal unequal quadrants. Um, so then when I get my drawing on the canvas, then I paint it with a brush and with my mixture, with my paint mixture. Very straightforward. Joan, is there anything you wanted to talk about um, more with the oils think, before we move quickly to the watercolors or Susan? I think you I think, uh, had a great I, question, Lewis. That was really good. That was said, um, you were asking her about the art historical um, precedents and different colors. Oh, yeah. I would like to even consider that hematite. I found once when I, when I started using the hematite, it seemed like a really magical material. I kind of like graphite has like all these extraordinary properties. So, um, yeah, it's so true. I just wanted to uh, backtrack and go into paint handling, which okay. is the most um, very, well, I guess everything's equally important. The, the material, the color, the light, the composition is very, very important. But the paint handling is the very important to me, you know, to the, the painters I admire, such as Velasquez or Bellini or um, any, any painter. Um, that's so important and I and I when I paint I want to have all my energy and focus go into to my application of the paint um, so that's all I wanted to say but uh, to get back to your question Joan what um, just refresh my memory because I was trying to remember I wanted to add that actually it's Lewis's question oh his yeah, story I can, I can, um, I thought, and I thought it was very um, there, especially looking at this uh, next to Annunziata on the left, um, there are some colors that have a certain art historical weight, especially lapis lazuli with the, the robes of Mary and medieval and Renaissance painting. Um, do colors feel, do you feel that weight of the colors, the historical weight, or are there colors that conversely feel new and fresh when you discover them? Um, or are they all treated equally in your mind? No, I definitely, I, I love the history of the colors and I, I love to read about them in, in old books and they're fascinating and they, they sort of seduce me but when I stand in front of, when I was standing in front of the Antonella Madonna, looking at this blue of her robe, it, uh, and it was on the green wall, um, I, I adored that painting. It was just such a great painting. And I wanted, I, I, I had an, a vision of how I could use, I had been using lapis for a while and I just uh, figured out um, right standing there, I was inspired by the green velvet, the blue on the green velvet wall, the blue painting. And I, it synced in with what I was doing and how I could turn it, how I could use lapis in my own form uh, to paint my painting in my form. So um, I, I guess I, I should say more about the history of colors. I, I wrote down something, but I don't know where I put it. What question are you asking about the, the history? The one about the, the historical weight of the, um, the pigments. But it's interesting thinking about lapis lazuli specifically in that the Latin root means uh, blue stone. And then we have that painting also titled Stone Cathedral. Um, and there's this constant reminder in your work that these pigments come from the earth and that minerality is very visible. Yeah, the, the, but you know, finally the history is incidental 
to my use of them. My, my use is always toward the realization of the success and the success of my painting. And the story, there, there is no story, like you don't have to know that I love the history of Lapis to look at this painting. You can look at it and it'll say whatever it wants to, to connect with you. So um, re the re earth reds too, there are so many interesting things. They're, they're the most ancient color. And the, cave, the first paintings were done with ochres and red earth and I, and I see them in land, you know, in the earth all over the world, whenever I travel, I, I see the red earths and they're just so endlessly fascinating. But that's not why I use them. I use them because I love those colors. I feel very passion when I look at red earth colors. That's why I use them. Do you think we should go into the other room now? Yeah. Lewis, have we, have we, um, Did, did you about? want to talk about the watercolors briefly before we go to the studio or should we focus on the oils? Up to you. I can say a little bit on the, <clears throat> I'll say a little bit of, about the relationship of the oils to the watercolors because people used to ask me why the watercolors were so different from the oil paintings. <clears throat> so, um, so I, I say that, you know, I usually, I often do the watercolors after the oil paintings. The oil paintings, the large oil paintings are the core of my work and they generate everything else, but they are all part of the same unity of my painting. They're, you know, they, they're there and they are part of it. And so I think the reason you can see this paper has its own characteristics. It, it has a, a personality that I want to work with. It's the best paper to work on. It's old Indian found paper and it was, it has holes in it that were used for ledger books and to hang them on the wall. So I love it because it takes the paint in a way that I like. I'm not fighting it. With watercolor, I like to paint in oil better than I like to paint in watercolor. See, so you can see some of the Sanskrit marks and notations on this piece of paper. Um, Can you talk a little bit about where the paper I, comes from? It comes from India. How you it's got it? It's a paper. And it's not, it's not a, it's an antique paper. It's a, it's a used paper. So, so uh, I found it in New York Central one time. And when I looked at it and felt it, I thought, oh, this painting, this paper is really interesting. I think, I think this could be really a treasure. So, so I bought a few pieces and tried it. And I loved it, so I went right back and bought a lot of it. And then they stopped getting it. So uh, a friend used to bring it from India. Friends that went to India would sometimes bring pieces to me, like Peter Soriano and Frank Andre Jam would find pieces in Rajasthan and bring them back to me. And they have stains and rips on them, and the. Viakul, the, the Indian painter and the anonymous Indian tantric painters, contemporary painters, used this paper. And I was in the drawing center looking at an exhibition of, of Indian tantric paintings that Frank and Andre Sham had curated. He, he was, um, they had let him into their society. They trusted him. And so he sort of brought um, these hidden secret paintings to the, to the fore of us being able to see them, which I really appreciate. But anyway, I, two women were saying, they were looking at one and they, they were saying, 
oh, it's it's great, but it has this stain on it, and it's ripped. <laughs> and and I just was, I knew that the artist who painted on that paint on that paper was doing it for the same reason I was doing it. <laughs> They were doing it because the paint and the marriage of the paint and the paper was wonderful for an artist to feel. So anyway, I in the back to the oils and the watercolors. In the oils, the entire linear composition is generated by the outside measure of the length of the panel to the width of the panel. And when I stack two of them, or later when I put them side by side, then the visual division of the panel enters into determining the composition as well. So Chart Cathedral and the Book of Kells figure into my reinforcement of my proportions. And the human figure's relation to experience the paintings also determines the scales and the sizes. I determine the the precisely measured frames of the oil paintings. And for the most part, I don't, de I don't determine the size of the watercolor paper or, or its edges. In the watercolors, the ingredients are, are, are oh, there's a, the ingredients are color, material, gum Arabic, handling as in the oil paint, except the medium is gum Arabic instead of oil, and the support is, is fan paper or other choices of paper. So all of that imparts a different look to the watercolors, and, and the watercolors aren't measured. So you can tell all this by looking at them it's interesting too with the with the when you're working on the in a sense found paper but like paper that's already had one life it's beautiful how it brings the outside world into your work in this very random way and i feel like that gives you a lot i I've, I've always loved that and i think yeah. it's it's you got to look at it from that angle in order to like not go oh god there's a stain <laughs> no but you you said it the history of the paper is there in front of your eyes it's so beautiful to to think about the history and i have it 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 really impresses itself on me too whatever the history unwritten history of this paper is you know sometimes i found cat print paw prints on them and it smelled like urine <laughs> but um it's a great paper it's a rag paper but they don't make it anymore and it's oh it's burnished that's an important fact too is it's burnished by hand does it have a particular name or is it um just rag paper antique rag paper you it's know like just lying a friend went to india and and she um laurie reed she i couldn't go to india i was going to go with her and i got sick and so she brought me back she went to a paper company and she bought a lot of new paper that they made and i have since uh ordered paper from them but she saw a pile of paper lying on the floor and she said, you know, she, she sh photographed it and said, do you want some of this paper? And I said, yes, get it all that you can. That's the paper. So she brought me two big piles of this skinny. It was a smaller format. It was about half of, of this paper. So um, it was a hard, it was too small for me to work on but I got a paper conservator to uh, put it together so that it has this format and that's, that's what this paper is. Let's see if you can. This is, this is the same paper, but it's, it's 
it's the attached together. Do they do? Yeah, uh, glue it on the back. She did it. I don't know how she did it, but it's it's part of the art. I tell you, <laughs> Marilee Hitchings. <laughs> A shout out to Marilee Hitchings. <laughs> She's a wonderful uh, person and conservator. Thank you. I can see in our audience that we have people that are really interested in the paper. Yeah, thanks for showing that. Well, I could go on and on about every aspect of the paintings, but um, my voice will give out <clears throat> and my brain. Did you want to go to look at the, the larger oils? Yes. Let's go. All right. Um, okay, so I'm going to leave your meeting. And I'm going to take my iPhone and walk down to my painting studio. It's just nearby. Great. So thank you, and I'll see you in a few minutes. Okay. So we should be getting her signal on the phone shortly. Um, she's gonna walk across the, the yard to the studio. And Sophia, can you give us a thumbs up when you have that for us? Are you fielding the chats? Do we have questions from the audience that we could bring into um, our discussion with her? Cause I, I was, once in a while I checked and saw like people wanted to know what the name of the paper was. Obviously that wasn't going to be possible, but is there anything else? I think there we do have some questions uh, for Susan that have been collected. Is that right, Sophia? Correct. We have, um, I think, about four questions and, and more rolling in. So um, once we get her live back on here, I, we have one from Serena Caffrey, um, from John Wilson and Christina McPhee. Great. And while we're waiting, I'll, I'll just put up some, some of the install views again, if that sounds good to you, Joan. Sounds great. Don't get tired of looking at it. I can see you, but can you see oh, me? Oh, there you are. Yes. yes. Oh, okay. I can't see myself. So, okay. Is that good? Yes. Okay. I'm going to head out to my studio. <laughs> This is very tricky. <laughs> Thanks for giving us a glimpse into the, the two studios. How can I turn turn it from me to my studio? Can I turn there should my... should be a, a reverse camera button on the bottom, I believe. Is that right? Oh, okay. Sophia? It's I think it sort of looks like a circle with two arrows. A circle with two arrows. Oh, okay, I got it. Okay. Great. So this is coming out my door. <laughs> Oops. I'll try not to fall down the stairs. <laughs> and I, this is my studio. I built this this studio with the help of people and and I keep um, wildflower pollinators instead of mowing. I try everything runs on electricity. I don't use fossil fuels here. I use solar. So the environment is. Um, I am a staunch environmentalist. Everybody should be. Okay. Can you tell us so, what direction your windows are facing that the light comes in from? So no, the light is northern light. I have big windows. So this is all northern light. And then this is the studio. Wow. Beautiful. Amazing. These paintings are probably going to be shown in London. My next show is 2020, 2021 in London. 
Oh, well, are you showing us finished paintings or unfinished painting? They're pretty much finished. Oh my God. That is so beautiful, Susan. <laughs> Thank you, Joan. You're a great audience. <laughs> <laughs> I no, love I'm not an audience. I'm a fan. I'm a fan. <laughs> well, and Susan, this I'm one is in the. Too. This one is in the catalog, isn't it, for the current show? Yeah. Do you have a title yeah. for this? I kept it untitled. I I actually would love to title everything untitled, but um, I I use designations in lowercase that aren't descriptive of the painting. And um, so, and this is this is the most recent one. This is I might I might do a larger variation of these colors. The, this should be uh, with side light. It has light too much light bouncing off of it. But um, I'm, is this small one on a wood panel or is this linen? It's on a wood panel. But I think I want to make, for the show in London, I want to have one stacked vertical painting. They, t they take a long time because um, I have five colors instead of two. But, um, and the, so I wanted to show you my notes. These are the notes where I document every step of the way so I can refer back to it if I need to. And so they become like records of the mixtures and the, you know, so I have a big stack of, of these for every, I have notes for every painting. I, I found that that was, I needed to do that as part of my um, evolution of making paintings. And then I, I make the plans, I'm going to, I have a lot of plans. I mix the I mix the paints on this color. This is my palette. It's a marble slab top, but I've been working on this very simple composition. But it's really hard. It's 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 taken me months and frustration, and it's so simple. But it's a it's a jarring element in the two panels, so I'm trying to make it work. And while you're making these plans, do you do color studies as well to go along with them? Um, or is it just line work in the beginning? Sometimes I I do whatever I need to do. I I start with these little sketches, like this, just to you know, like um, here's one that I just to get my idea down so that I can refer to it. And then I make a lot of um, swatches. So at the same time, I'm, I'm laying out these swatches to try to formulate, you know, what the colors will be. And so everything is a decision. This is a lapis swatch. So that, <clears throat> that's in that painting over there. It's lapis. I think something that most people wouldn't realize about painting, um, and this goes back to your notes that we looked at when we came in, is that there is a certain chemistry when you're working with pigments that you need to um, keep track of what colors are, you know, what mediums are going on top of each other if you want to make shifts in the colors because you always have to obey that, what the painters call the, the fat over uh, lean rule, and you can't reverse that or you- Oh, absolutely. The fat over lean says it all. <laughs> and, I, and I've ruined some paintings by, by taking too much of a risk with fat over lean, not, to, not letting the paint dry fast enough or long enough. What but, did uh, I I think about that as like when you're choosing a color, it has its, um, you know, like the word is escaping now, how much oil it can absorb, its absorbency rate. 
so that once you make a certain decision with certain pigments that eliminates a whole range of other pigments that you can use on that painting because by their by their structure they're just never going to absorb enough oil to to be fat to that color and let that color be the lean part so it yeah. Yeah, you know, Vitruvius said that um, the architect, meaning the artist, needed to know about other fields of knowledge too. And, and I think there's a lot of science in painting. And, and I love science. I mean, you love science too, and architecture and, med, you know, how your body is, what it's built of and so on and so forth. Um, so I, I, I appreciate um, so much what you're saying. You're talking like a true painter. Um, so I wanted to go up close to this indigo. This indigo is probably the best indigo. Uh, it's, it's really, it has light coming from underneath it. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to get that but it has all the dimensions of the indigo that I, but it, okay, we're starting to see it now. It's just so purple though. It should be, it's, it's the color is completely off. So I can see that's not going to work. I think. What is the middle red pigment? That's more of a true color. Um, but the iPhone isn't, isn't um, capable of showing the true color. That's, that's kind of close to the real color. But I was hoping to show you the transparency of the indigo light coming through. It's also very dark in my studio today. I think uh, another thing that um, people don't always realize is, you know, when you buy paint in tubes that's commercial paint and you're not working from um, raw substances, you don't have the control over the medium that's really essential for your work. I mean, to get the transparency, the reflectivity, the density that is so important in the, in the physical manifestation of your work and how that communicates, you have to have these um, incredible skills and, and um, experience with materials. And a lot of it just comes from working with materials over a long period of time and getting to know them. So you know, it's not just that you know the color, but you know the substantive aspects of how that color comes about in painting, you know, and what its limits are in terms of, you know, can it, some colors can only be used in watercolor with gum Arabic as a medium and other colors will, you know, can be ground in, into oil paints. And um, I don't know, I, I, when I look at your studio, I, I just feel like I have to say this so people can appreciate more the amount of time and um, the expertise that's involved in what you're actually doing. And there's the pigments on the table right there, you know, and you got to know what to do with these things. Yeah, you know, some, some of the pigments, you're so right, they don't hold up with oil and you don't know that until 10 years later when the painting falls apart and <laughs> the collector might not be so happy <laughs> when that you, happens. You pour over the materials manuals that give you these, there's a lot of interesting books out on the, on the history of pigments and when they come about and that's a very interesting thing to know. Um, Lewis kind of touched on that earlier. Yeah, I always have trouble finding answers in the books so I, I used to refer to the books a lot, and maybe there are new books that I don't know about, but um, I, I just never had, I felt so inadequate with my knowledge of technique because I never really learned that in art school. I didn't go to art school, by the way. I went to, I majored in liberal arts and, and, um, with a major in fine arts, but it wasn't, it was liberal arts, which I'm grateful for because I loved the, the science subjects I took and um, I think they, they are important. And, um, you know, a lot of artists have a back, say, I was gonna 
say that Louise Fishman, for example, knows a lot about music. She she's a music. She was a musician too, and Paul Mogensen started out as an aero engineer, and Fred Sandback studied philosophy. And I think you can see that in their work. That it enhance it it enhances their work in some ways. I don't know. Can you go back to the painting that's on the end wall that's got the um, almost pink color in the center on the opposite wall? Oh, this one? That yeah. one? Yes. Um, there was a question from the audience. Someone wanted to know, wanted you to talk about what that color is in the center. That color is, um, uh, okay. I have to give away my secret mixture here. Oh, you it, made the color. It's not a yeah. pure pigment. Yeah. No, I made it. And I, I never I never used white or black, but I used white in that color. So it's a mixture of white and red and yellow. And Susan, how many different types of oils are you using with different pigments? Well, I use um, mostly co cold press soil. Almost, that's the most uh, prevalent. I use stand oil. Um, I use sun thickened oil. And I use thinner, the Gamsol thinner that you see here. Um, I don't, you know, I, I measure it all now because it saves me time to measure it. So that's uh, basic, it's basically just oil and pigment. And I use, you know, I use the colors according to what I need. I grind, I usually grind the red earth colors. So these are all my mixtures that are, that I had ground and saved them. But I use a lot of Rublev colors and I use Old Holland and um, what's this? Yeah, Old Holland. I, you know, I use the color for, for the quality and for the color itself. Like I have different lapis lazulis, but I use, I like the Daniel Smith the, the best. I use uh, these, I've used them all. There are three companies that make lapis and I use blocks for the indigo. Do you mean lapis that's actually ground from the stone? Yeah, I, I don't do the grinding. I buy it ground. All these three lapises are, are genuine lapis lazuli. I remember reading in that, that book that um, Baxendall wrote about the 15th century that, that the lapis um, was a process that could take up to six months, you know, of soaking and grinding and it had to sit in that oil for a long time. So um, you know why they had so many assistants back then. Yes, and you know, the story, um, I wanted to, I looked, at some of the villages in Afghanistan, which is heartbreaking how poor the country is. And that's where the lapis, a lot, I think most of the lapis comes from Afghanistan, but there's just so much war and trouble there that it, it breaks your heart to even think of using lapis. And I, I, um, I'm very aware of, of the pain that might go into into my tube of lapis. And here I am in the lap of luxury using it to make a painting. On that note, let me say that uh, the lapis that comes from Afghanistan often um, has gold flecks in it. Have you ever seen that? Yes, yes. So incredible. I'm sure they don't grind that into the paint, but... Um... Well, there, it's fascinating to see the villages where the, up in the mountains where they get the lapis. When did you go there? 
I didn't go there. <laughs> I wish I would love to go there, but I've never been to Afghanistan. I went there in the 70s, in 1971. Oh. That's great. That's wonderful. And I remember visiting these um, workshops and they would mount these little pieces of lapis on, on the end of a stick and then hold it, you know, by a grinder and a polisher for hours in order to polish it. Fascinating. Well, let's go back someday. <laughs> you yeah. can take me with you. I don't know. <laughs> Probably heartbreaking to see how it's changed. This was like four or five years before the Russians were went in there, and it was still like it hadn't changed for a thousand years. You still had all the people, like the Berbers living in the tents, you know, the Yakir tents out in the fields. And I've always so admired that collect that culture so much. I wish I could see it firsthand, but it's it's. Um, pretty sad what's what happens in the world we have to keep making art because that's what humans do they make art too even everywhere well can you show us a little painting behind you to your right on the wall the little little version of the pink center Yes. <laughs> oh, wow, that looks like a gem. That was, that was the forerunner of the big one. Yeah, I was wondering. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Susan, for letting us into your studio. And uh, maybe, Sophia, it's a good time to go to audience questions, if there are any. Yes, certainly. Um, thank you so much. I could stay in your studio all afternoon, <laughs> but that Me would too. be selfish. <laughs> so why don't we start I off? Um, in my studio. <laughs> it's, it's heaven. Um, I know Serena had a few questions. Serena, I'm going to pass you the mic um, so you can ask. Hi, thank you so much. Um, Hi. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. I'm at work, so it's a little tricky of a situation. I wanted to say first, thank you so much for this treat, seeing your work. It's so meaningful. Um, and I wanted to ask you specifically about if you have any um, rituals or way that you ways that you enter the studio to get you into a mindset of um, being ready to paint. And I think we already got a little bit of a window into this, seeing just your walk from your home to the studio, the stone path, and the plants along the way but is there anything else um any particular well, objects or scents that it's it's so great to be working up here in the in a large well-lit studio it's just so great and it saves me two hours out of my day to walk from my house right into my studio so i can get in here at nine or 10 in the morning. And um, I love the mornings to work in my studio. The light is just so beautiful all day long. And in the summer, it's, it's really long. And sometimes um, when I'm just doing more tedious work, you know, like uh, drawing on the, the diagram, if I, if I have to do intense thinking work, I have the silence. But if I'm, even sometimes when I'm painting, I, I put on some music. And one of the most recent uh, things I've been listening to is, is ancient Japanese court music. It's called Gagaku. And I, it, it's, I don't understand it at all. It's completely foreign to me. And I love that because it helps me um, find a place where I'm neither, <coughs> I'm just able to focus solely on my painting. <coughs> Do you have some water there with you? Yeah, I'm getting some. <laughs> um, wonderful, well, I will cue in Fong Bui. Uh, Fong, you can turn your mic on. Join us at the table. Tree. <laughs> Fong, hello. 
Hello. Hello. Well, what a treat. I mean, I'm so incredibly grateful that we have this glimpse of your beautiful studio and wonderful conversation back and forth. And, and wonderful, your colors are wonderful. It looks like a a pre a, a pre Renaissance earth green. Well, One of my favorite colors. Oh well, listen, <laughs> I Nicosia. It's Nicosia. Oh, you remember the last time, the last time that, um, that we ran each other? Well, we we saw each other since, but the last time that we were together at the Demonil was when I was down there being invited to one of the judges for the Water Hop Award for Curatorial Excellence. I think it might have been 2015. And I ran into you there and you were including that exquisite show. It's called Experiment with Truth. Gandhi and Images. Of oh, Science. yeah. Oh, wow. That was a wonderful show. Yes. What a great show. And it was exquisite. <laughs> Curated by Rosa Heavenstein. Yeah. Was, yeah, that was, that was great. Yeah, so. Beautiful, the, beautiful the show. The question is because of that show, you have several works on paper, and then there's a painting that really knocked me off my socks, were full, I believe it's called Full and Empty. I took note on my, on my notebook, I took down a few notes on, on that trip. Yeah. What occurred to me, um, Susan, is that I read the catalog essay and immediately it brought me back to the memory when I was reading a transcript uh, of Paul Tillich, you know, the great um, Christian existentialist theologian that taught at the seminary school in Columbia University, who really wrote two excellent books. It's called the courage to be and, faith. and I remember in the sense the transcript at some point somebody was asking him uh, about the sense of self-will and spirituality and the person asked if may Ruth the ultimate self-will and ultimate aim in life is to eat to hit as much as many home run if he can it's possible can can that aspiration be considered as part of spiritual longing? You know, so my point is that the whole thing about the Demonio, going back to Dominic, uh, it was that she had a, an incredible mentor and a friend, the Dominican monk, remember? Marie Alain Couture, who really created the, the chapel for Matisse. One of his things is that how can welcome modern art as equivalent of spirituality without overt this economy uh, without overt appearances? Um, so my my question is that how would you describe now, Susan, where you are today, your sense of spirituality? I mean, it basically fall on the last question. You know, there's certain ritual and whatnot, but I mean it deeper than that, you know? Can you unmute yourself? We can't hear you. Oh, Susan, uh, I think your audio has become muted. Yeah. Hmm. Um, I just reprompted you to turn your mic back on. Let's see if that helps. Try us now. No, seem to have lost you. Have you plugged into anything? Let me check the settings. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Go back. Is that better? Yeah, better. Can I hear you? Yes. Can you hear me okay? I, I don't think I can hear you the, now though. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can't hear you. Did you we question, Susan? Nampong ask you? You hear my question. I will, I'll text Susan. Okay. And 
and we'll, we'll get her maybe back on her her desktop will be a safer bet could i go back to my desktop yes okay. good idea yeah so we we can keep talking joan lewis okay i mean i was gonna say sophia better get busy if she's gonna try to text that question because <laughs> complex and intense. <laughs> but, but Fong, you were talking about spirituality and um, Susan had mentioned the tantric painting before uh, the show that was curated by Frank Andre Jam. And there's a wonderful book that I encourage everyone to find, uh, maybe at the library if they can, about the tantric paintings. And I think they're so interesting to look at in conversation with Susan's work. Yeah. It's also written by Frank Andre Jam. Exactly. We have that. That's actually how I met her years ago was I, when they had the first tantric show at the drawing center, I wrote a piece for the rail. It was one of the first pieces. It was like 2003 or something. Yes. And uh, then I was at the opening somewhere and she came up to me and said, oh, you wrote that piece. And then we became friends from there. That's amazing. You're back. Can you hear us okay, Susan? I think she's going to head back to her desktop, so I'm sending the link right now. So okay. she'll rejoin us from the other room momentarily. No, it was it was very uh, rather, um, you know, advanced when Father Couturier sort of promote the idea of being a Dominican priest or monk that in order to prolong and, and, and welcome the old same standardized you know, mural of uh, the old tradition. He really broke through the idea of, you know, welcoming abstract art, modern artists to a uh, commission work for, for churches and interior of different, you know, spiritual practice. And that's where the Dominio was built on that premise. And Dominique had stated very clearly in one of the early letter when she welcome him to, to Texas as early as the 50s, early 50s, I would say. So it's so interesting. Was um, you know, paved the way for the Dominion itself, leading to the Rothko Commission in the late 80s, 60s, sorry. Um, he completed in 72 or 73. After oh, Rothko died, actually. Died. Suicide. Yeah, do, Fong, do you know if he, um, the Dominican monk, was still around when she reconstructed that uh, chapel with the, w was he involved in that project as well? Yeah, that was, um, yeah, her son uh, designed? Yeah, in fact, it was, uh, it might have been Cage who, who also came down and performed in one of the instances. I think we do have Susan back. Susan, can you hear us? <laughs> I'm happy to listen through. <laughs> <laughs> I caught you. Well, just to know that you're here. getting all <laughs> Did you get your water? You got to drink a little water. Yeah. Water. yeah. Oh, Thank you, mommy. <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> I'm proud. I got my water here. <laughs> well, well, you know, it's just experience. <laughs> Okay, so Fong, did you get Fong's question? Uh, something about spiritual. <laughs> <laughs> You're like my daddy. He used to want to take me to church all the time and I didn't want to go. <laughs> that was something else. Yeah, it was definitely. But the question is very simple, Susan. You know, spirituality for us now, it means many things. It always related to a certain spiritual, I mean, religious practice. It's not about religious ritual that conform or support the idea of spirituality. Uh, but my question is simply by having a certain spiritual longing through the form color, the work that you make, it requires a lot of serenity, meditative state of mind. Uh, so I just want to just ask that question, you know, you've done this long enough, and how would you talk about it now? I, I think, um, I don't, 
art is my um, serenity. When I go into my studio, I can breathe a sigh of freedom. I'm free when I go in my studio because that's, I guess it's like a sanctuary and I can do, I can do what I want to do there. So I leave the world, so to speak, in spirit and go into my studio. Um, I've, I believe, um, my, my guiding principles are, are fact and reality and science. And, and I feel like everything, I don't know about Spirit, spirituality is talk, but, but it has to really be reality. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So everybody has their own way of, yeah. of dealing. We all have souls. Every living thing seems to have a soul, but it's held by the physical. As far as I know, it's held by the physical body. Yeah. That's a whole other... I another thing. Okay, I can so leave. art. How how I don't really have much to say about how art. I feel like humanity has always done art, and it's part of being human. Yeah. And that's all I have to say about it. I really uh, don't have any. Well, let let me weigh in here just for a second uh, and say like. A bit, taking a question from the audience and where they're saying like this work is giving them a spiritual experience right. and people are experiencing it that way. And I think this is a really important um, distinction to make that because people have spiritual experiences with work, it doesn't mean the work is spiritual. The spirituality is in human beings and their souls. And, and Susan, you kind of said this, but I, I just thought I'd take it a step further. No, it's it's not thank you. Thank you for doing that. You're, you're it's so true. articulate. It's, it's true, but I let me be just a little bit more clear in my question. Because I remember visiting you when you had the tiny studio and Elizabeth Foundation. You know what I mean? So if you were to say that it has to have factual or the physical body relating to the surrounding space, so now it's more liberating. Now that you have your ideal space in the studio, it's differently than when you were there at, at the Elizabeth Foundation. Not really. I feel that I felt the same at the Elizabeth Foundation. When I get to my studio, even on days when I didn't feel well, mm -hmm. if I could make it to my studio, then I could. Then I felt so much better. It's it's almost healing for me to be able to do my work. That's great. Well, that's, I, I do, you know, it's hard work too. I got my answer because you <laughs> just say it, healing. That's it. That's the equivalent it's of- It's consoling. Yep. You know, with all the trouble, after 9-11, the first thing I did was go to the Metropolitan Museum to try to find my footing. Yeah. You know, and there, there it was, it was a sanctuary. Thank you. It took a while to get you to say that word. So I'm, I'm satisfied, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, thank you very much. So we have Amy at the ready with the next question. Amy, um, you wanna pipe up? Hi. Hi. Suzanne, I was wondering about your experience in Paris going to the Beaux-Arts. Because I went there in the 70s and 80s, and very few Americans were there, and I think very few Americans went there. So if you could just talk a little bit about maybe what that was for you. Oh, that sounds like fun. I was so happy to get to pa back to Paris. It was like my whole life was focused on how could I get back to Paris. So I, I worked a summer on, on an airline and I saved my money and I got off, I got a free flight to Paris because I worked on the airline. And, and so I was in heaven because um, 
So I went to the Beaux Arts. I needed a place to paint. I only had a little tiny room in it was horrible in my layout. And so I went with my little portfolio to the Andre Chastel studio and asked him if I could work in his studio and he said yes. So I paid ten dollars to the French government or whoever and I had a place to paint in the in the studio and I went there every day and painted and I worked I worked in a restaurant at night. I got a job in a restaurant and um, so I had a place to paint and I had meals, French food that cost 35 cents a meal and I was the only American so I got to learn French because I, I didn't want to speak English. Um, so I only spoke French. I had to work my way. I learned French from speaking it, not from, from school. And I looked at a lot of work in the museums. That was, that really was so much part of my education is going to see real paintings because in the U S I only saw pictures of paintings and I only saw it from the abstract expressionist tip of the iceberg. So I knew there was much more to know about painting. So that was really a big part of my education, doing it and looking at artwork. It's great. Great to hear. Very parallel to my time there. How many years were you there? Oh, I lived in Paris for six years. Oh. And I went through the whole Beaux-Arts program and oh, fantastic. Had, had lunch, full hot French lunches in the student <laughs> cafeteria for like 75 cents. But mainly the access, <laughs> the, the access to the museums was nonstop and it was yeah. free for a, a yeah. student. Yeah. And that was where the most of the learning was. But we also learned to grind our paint and had a pretty deep um, courses and technique of painting. And oh, that's wonderful because I had none of that. I didn't have any, I just went to the studio and worked and once in a while the Mr. Chastel would say something but nothing that was relevant. Well, <laughs> true. <laughs> he was good, he was not bad but it wasn't where I learned about painting. <clears throat> um, thank you. thank you very very much. Always beautiful to see a little a little shared history in the room. Um, we have a a few more questions, um, Susan. Depending on your energy levels, we can do one or two. Um, but next, okay, one, I'm, or two, one or two more. I'm, I think um, perfect. A little redundant. And I'm, You've been very generous with us today, yeah, so uh, we appreciate it. Um, so Daisy, I'll I'll hand it over to you. Um, I'll prompt you to turn your mic on. I'm very curious about very your question about your also. Question. Okay. Oh, Daisy, hi. <laughs> My I, I have the great good fortune of being Susan's neighbor. And oh, me too. I have a very good energy level. Um, you know, in a painting like in the the one with the indigo, those large areas, I've I've heard you say that you go over an entire area in one day and at, I just marvel at the physical effort that these large-scale paintings uh, require and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and also about uh, just how accident or incident uh, plays a part of, of your process. Oh, great question. I'm happy to try to answer it. Um, it's so true. Those big areas, especially when they have a lot of stand oil in them, it's, it's very hard to get them applied in a, in a very sensual way that I want to keep in the paint. So I have to really start in the morning and, and be in, in good shape because Physically, it is very taxing. And then I, f I finish in the afternoon and I still have to clean my brushes. So 
the last thing I do at night, sometimes at 10 o'clock at night, I'm still washing my brushes. And um, so that it, it is physically taxing. And I describe it as the size of the painting is exponentially more difficult the bigger it is. If I'm working on a 12 inch painting, it's so much easier than a, than a nine foot painting. And I have to make sure I mix enough paint too. Sometimes I'll run, God forbid, I run out of paint in the, before I get the whole surface covered. And that's terrible because I have the proportions, precise proportions mixed. And uh, yeah, sometimes, well, um, there's a painting, let's see, the yellow painting. I, I thought I had enough lemon yellow to do that yellow. And I was, I had built up to put, to apply that yellow, the temperature. It wasn't too humid that day. And I had good light and I had energy and I started mixing the paint. And then I realized I had the wrong color. The wrong color had come. They had sent, I wanted lemon yellow cadmium and they had sent lemon, they sent cadmium yellow light. And so it's not the same thing. I needed cadmium lemon. So I started going through my paint box and pulling out nickel yellow. And I kept, I finally mixed up a big batch and I, I put it on and it wasn't the same color but I, I let it dry and I was very depressed that night that I wasn't the same color that I wanted. And then a few days later when it dried and I put it up on the wall, I was so happy with it. It just glowed. It was, it was so luminous. It was gorgeous. And so it, it was a happy accident. I've had some that aren't so happy, like when I was saying that I removed the hematite five times and reapplied it. That was not, the luck wasn't with me that day. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think this is a, a beautiful note to end on. And um, some of you who have been here before may know that we typically close our events with a poetry reading and we have a very special oh, guest today. Oh, I love But first, please, Susan, Joan, Lewis, thank you for such an enjoyable afternoon. For everyone in the audience, if you want to share this with your friends, um, all of our events, including this one, are posted online in their entirety to be watched for free by anybody. Um, so you can go to our event site. Thank if you, you wanna... everyone for- Thank you, Susan. For your help, Louie and Joan and Sophia and the good questions. I so great to see you. Enjoyed it. I can't wait to talk shop with you, Joan. So it's so and everyone, everyone that can should go see the show up uh, until the 17th of October, I believe. Really worth it to see them in person. Great, thank you for the plug. <laughs> um, wonderful, well, let me introduce Pansy and then I will pass you over the mic. Um, Pansy Moore Alvarez was born in Puerto Rico and lives in Strasbourg. She has published six collections of poetry and is a contributing editor to Tears in the Fence and Osiris. She's completing a book length poem, Legend of the Winter Trip and learning to play the Celtic harp. Um, Pansy? Hello. You want to take it away? Hello. Hi. Hey. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Well, well, thank you for inviting me to read uh, today and uh, to be able to join all of you everywhere uh, and share some poetry. That was a really, really amazing conversation. And I feel um, transported by these colors. And uh, I feel as though I'm with Susan in her studio and uh, I have to sort of pinch myself to say, no, I'm supposed to read poetry now and, and leave that for the moment. Um, so I'm going to read excerpts from this very, very long piece that I've been working on for a very, very long time. Um, and um, uh, some have appeared in the Brooklyn Rail and in other places. And um, uh, so I, I'll just um, welcome you into my legend of the winter trip. 
Who were we told to be in the shadowy nations, the fields and forests and rivers and floods? We, our fingers, our whispers, our thrills, frail cheekbones, snapped wrists, cross sections of vigor. Multitudes started walking out of the nations, land and family, down the street, running and screaming through the broadcast, screaming and wailing. Who were we told to be? The calendar is cold. A year forms and gathers weight. An orphan empire rising, the next state of mistaken sounds and blows and mental shifts, flush pink against altars, the daily aim of rival, a round of secrets. Her father in the netherworld that hard red sound sticks and stumbles a mad yellow, roar against strange tongues to understand space, space partially. The swollen bud, bloodshot homeland, who cradles the broken sigh? Carrying a child, carrying a sapling, carrying a sheep, carrying papers, carrying some money, the woman's red dress, a downpour of ownership touches her summer cries, the physical avoiding the absurd, a misstep, a shadow, secretly exchanged in the wilderness for the story of that little girl. Edge into the winter room, the room is sharpening its fracture zone open to the sky. Comb straight the slipping paths, the private seed belongs. The unremembered body, the corpse's pale water fingers. Oath of office, frantic peacemaking, token of winter, cup, moon, mountainside, drum, flute, words answering the equal parts of our shadow names. The shape, the place, the body, direction, the dream. Off balance of valor, expecting the traumatized, the whole trip being human in motion, the pain, dignity, beads, beetles, piles of old towels, folding chairs and little to eat. Accept and understand the road, especially at night. Big changes, world economic, inhale, exhale, barefoot. At this point in the project, problem solving operations, briefly committed to a certain class of problems. Automated reasoning, futile home remedies under unambiguous passive microscopes, actors and dancers, comedians and singers, particularly in question. It's a winter trip that doesn't begin in winter. And I have two more excerpts. They are barely peeled back in the image of forefathers and children bearers because of their limits, edging away from annoyed and firsthand political and widespread. Everybody breaks out into storm. Here there is nothing. The austere legend is only remembered if wet with song and coarse with glittering, orange and silver and gold. The position of palms and feet opening and withdrawing in dance, the entire space of impersonal questions, a sphere, a password, a permit. The sun sets equal to birth. Trustworthy beige, trustworthy beige envelopes arrive with their arrangement of promises. What do you hope to achieve from this matrimony? Answer all questions legibly and wait. Dictionaries are beautiful. She said when he chose the route, I gave you a position you didn't ask for. What do you remember of it now? 
I liked your guidance, he said, and he thought exactly blue, deliberately. His voice became the winter, his ancestors and even his descendants folded into the reach of his arms, his hands dancing slowly, ever so slowly in the air we all breathe. Benedictus qui venit, qui venit, qui venit, Benedictus qui. Thank you. Candy, thank you so much for a gorgeous ending to a wonderful day so far. I don't know how I'm going to top this. <laughs> <laughs> it was a wonderful conversation. I, I'm really, it's very inspiring. Thank you very much, Susan, for thank that. You. Thank you for your And thank you for Brooklyn Rail for hosting this. And thank, thank you, Candy. Thank you, Fong. It was such a pleasure. We, we do hold these events every day. And on Wednesdays, we hold a radical poetry reading tomorrow with Kay Gabriel curating, featuring political poetry read by Dagon Brown, Amy Dia, Brendan Joyce, Wendy Trevino, Adjua Gargi, and Zynga Greaves, and Eddie. Um, so I hope you come back and see us again. Folks can turn on their microphones if they'd like to say goodbye to our wonderful speakers today. Um, Susan, you were absolutely fabulous. Thank you for for our tour. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you all so much. Thank you. Oh, wonderful show. Oh, wonderful oh, show. Thank you so much. Really thank good. You. Thank you. Wonderful show. So much nourishment. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, bye, John. Oh. Hey, John. <laughs> hey, John. Bye. <laughs> Hello. A lot of artists here with us today. Andrew, what's happening, Andrew? Hi, and, hi Hearn. Hey. Thanks, John. Thanks, Susan. Hey. I'm not going to play the guitar for you, Fong. I lost my hand. Oh, Hearn. <laughs> Bicycle accident. Oh, oh man.